Welcome to another edition of the Bleed Lows Podcast. This week's podcast is presented by our partners at Bet Online. They continue to be the number one source for all of your betting needs and sports information. Find all of the latest odds on uh, sports developments, including this year's Stanley Cup Finals, Major League Baseball, and the latest fighting news, and even next season's early NFL futures. Head over to their website today. Use your mobile device. Uh, that website is betonline.ag. Sign up today, and you'll receive your 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit by using our promo code, which is BELIEVE, B-L-E-A-V, and you'll get that bonus and get into all of the action. Bet online where the game starts. Thanks to them for presenting this week's episode of the podcast. Uh, this week, stopping by La Carne Asada uh, is one of my personal favorite pitchers from what I didn't realize was a long time ago until literally when I started doing a little bit of research. Uh, Dontre Willis, the D-Train, who's, uh, who's been ruffling feathers in a good way uh, on Sportsnet LA. Dontre, thanks for stopping by, man. Honored to be on the show. Excited. Thank you for having me. Yeah, absolutely. Well, first and foremost... Uh, one of my favorite stats about you is that you're the first pitcher to hit a grand slam since Robert Parson in 2002 <laughs> when he hit one off of Jose Lima, you, uh, against, the, uh, against the Mets back in 2008. I have to ask you, as a former pitcher myself, who was a garbage at, at hitting, <laughs> what, what was that feeling like when you hit that grand slam? Because as you recall, pitchers were kind of looked at as like garbage time at bats, and you just went out there and, and crushed one. Um, you know, you know, it, it's crazy because God rest his soul, Jose Lima was a, a, a really good guy and a mentor and, and someone that I, you know, uh, kind of emulated my game after a high energy guy, always positive. So, you know, um, that day, um, he was tipping his pitches and all of a sudden I just picked up on what he was trying to do. And we all know that Jose Lima had one of the best change ups and that was his favorite pitch. And I was looking for that thing. And, and when I guess right, I just hit it. And as soon as I hit it, I knew it was gone. And, and just to be on the road and silence that obnoxious Mets crowd <laughs> that I love to do, um, it was it was an awesome feeling. And just hearing my dugout just go crazy, and uh, it, 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 it was fun. But I, I felt bad because that was Jose Lima's last start, <laughs> you know, with the Mets, you know. But, uh, you know, as a pitcher, um, there's no greater feeling than hitting a home run and even better hitting a grand slam. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I never hit one because garbage. But still, I mean, it, to hit one off of one of the best change-ups ever. And uh, correction, it was in 2006. My apologies. Uh, but also, fast forward a few months, you hit two home runs in one game against the Mets again, against uh, the, the, the ageless wonder, Ali Perez, and, uh, and Roberto Hernandez. So, I mean, obviously... Were they were they tipping pitches again, or was that just one of those like, oh, okay, uh, you you can just rake? Well, first of all, Ali must have struck out seven of our first eight batters, so he was just dealing. So I was like, listen, I'm not going to allow him to get the two strikes to strike me out. I'm swinging at the first thing out of his hand, so he could have <laughs> threw that thing off the net, and I would have swung at it, like you know what I mean. So he just threw it right down the middle, and I and I barreled it. And the one uh, the home run in our Hernandez, I remember. It was the first time I ever seen a split finger, and I was like, there's no chance I could hit that, so you better hit this fastball. <laughs> and some, somehow I, I worked the count to 3-2, and he threw so hard. I never saw the pitch. I just got my foot down and swung, and I barreled it, and I thought it was a double, and it kept going. And uh, Sean Green, who actually I met last night, was in the outfield, and he brought that up. And he was like, man, it was a missile like you're a position player. And, and I was, just, I just went nuts running around the bases. And again, you know, it, it was another situation where my dugout just shook their head like only Don Trell would do some crap like this. Uh, <laughs> but uh, it, it was a fun feeling to be able to do that and get the victory for my club. No, absolutely. And before we get into the Dodger stuff, just, you know, because uh, it's crazy to say this, there's a generation that didn't see you pitch. And mm -hmm. as you know, with baseball, you know, it's, oh, I didn't see Koufax pitch. I didn't see Valenzuela pitch because I was too young. You know, and in this case, a lot of people didn't see what, you know, kind of the phenomenon that was Dontro Willis. You know, you went out there, flat brim. That's the thing I remember mm -hmm. about guys <laughs> talking about in the clubhouse. Yeah, you're out there rocking the flat, <laughs> flat brim to the side. You know, mm -hmm. you, you brought a little swagger. Uh, and you also had a very unique delivery, but holy shit, you were good. You know, you had that deception. You know, you, you also had a little bit of, of, a, of a kink with timing that threw a lot of guys off. And your stuff was good, right? But you also played on a really good 
2003 Florida Marlins team, when you look at that roster and you're just like, whoa, like when you see the names on that roster, it's, you know, it's, it's not at this point, it's, it's borderline legends, right? But when, when all that stuff was going on, walk us kind of through what it was like for Dontrell Willis, you, you know, the man, the person to kind of absorb all of that at that time. Well, um, great question. Um, I'm 21 years old, uh, get called to the big league. So regardless of where you're playing at and who you play for, you know, you're all wide eyed and, you know, you're, you're, you're taking in the blessings because you finally made it to the pinnacle, but you also want to stay up there too. And uh, I make my first start and then they fire our manager the next day. So I'm experiencing all these things, you know, within a 24 hour radius, you know, I, we had a walk off the night before and they fired our manager the next day. But um, I was just, uh, you know, I'm just extremely blessed to play with Pudge Rodriguez, a Hall of Famer, who's my catcher. I'm never shaking that guy off. So that takes that out of it, you know what I mean? And so Derek Lee at first base, Mike Lowell at third base, Miguel Cabrera gets called up a month after me, a close friend of mine. So it was nice to have two young rookies kind of go through the process of being big leaguers. And also this, you know, winning ball games, especially in Miami, you Dodger fans are kind of spoiled. It doesn't happen as often, if you will, you know what I mean? So, you know, being able to kind of be part of something that turns the ship around and being one of the most unlikely World Series winners of all time, uh, it was this whirlwind, man. Like, my mom saw me in Double A, and I was sleeping on Miguel's couch. Fast forward a month later, I have my own place in, a, in an Escalade in Miami Beach. So she's just like, oh, this is too much. Like, you know, this is, this is going like, this is going too fast. Like my son's on billboards, you know what I mean? He thinks he's handsome and he's not like, it, we got his real <laughs> man, you know? So it was this, it was this, you know, I, I, I leaned, I leaned on my teammates a lot. Uh, they hazed me a lot. Like I was serving food on the plane, uh, getting alcohol for them on the plane. Like they did a good job of, um, keeping me humble, but at the same time, building me up when they needed to, because they understood that they needed me to be good for their ball club, but, uh, never, never, uh, change a moment in that, in that run. And it was a good experience. And for the record, the opening day starters for that team, Josh Beckett, Luis Castillo, one of the best second basemen, in my opinion, that ever played, mm -hmm. uh, Derek Lee for space, Mike Lowell at third base, uh, mm -hmm. Juan Pierre in center field. Obviously, Dodger fans know who that is. Pudge Rodriguez, uh, a name that that I didn't think it a lot of praise at the time. Uh, Juan Encarnacion playing yes. out in a, in right field. Uh, another name that didn't get a lot of uh, praise, Alex Gonzalez playing shortstop, and uh, and Todd Hollinsworth. But when you kind of look down the rest of the roster and the changes that were made, it, it, dude, you walked into kind of like what this clubhouse for the Dodgers are now, right? So d did that even make you even more wide-eyed on top of like, oh, okay, I have to go find my major leaguer to get me through the thing, but I'm also walking into this team that they don't have a lot on, on, the, on the plate, if you will, but they're still superstars here. Yeah, I mean, you know, they all worked hard, and that's the one thing that I love about the Dodgers, you know, and, and I'm in the background. You know, Freddie Freeman's the MVP. He still comes out and does his work to get himself prepared for, for the ball game. And, and so you see in all these guys – have these nuances and then you're like aha this is why they're good and that's the same thing with our ball club when i was in the marlins like we defended well we wanted to throw strikes we knew how we were going to win ball games and so styles make fights um and you know when the dodgers are going good you know they play clean baseball and they catch the ball they they they, they take the extra base they throw strikes so you know it, it's the same formula and, and i don't care if they put a uh, a track man or a pitch com man. There's certain nuances in the game that will never change for the next 200 years of this ball game. You have to do the little things right. You have to prepare on a daily basis, and you have to trust your stuff. So, uh, you know, they had a lot more star power <laughs> than we did, a lot more <laughs> firepower, if you will. But we knew uh, if we played our style of baseball and, you know, through strikes, we had a good chance and we were able to win a World Series championship doing that. And before I throw it to my uh, to my co-host Juanito here, uh, uh, one thing I'll say, last thing I'll say on it, uh, you also beat the the fighting mighty Yankees, who yeah. were also really good, and mm -hmm. and you again you were the underdog, right? And you went out there and punched them in the mouth, and I and I'm all about giving people their flowers while they're still here, not when they're gone. So mm -hmm. hey, what, what, you know, all respect in the world because that those Yankee teams were 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 stupid dangerous. You know, it, it's a weird thing because when we made it after we beat the Cubs and, and Mark Pryor, who 
never lets it down that we beat him. And Mark's the best guy in the world. I'm like, you got to stop bringing that up, man. Like that was 20 years ago. But uh, no, um, you know, it, you know, I think they kind of felt like I wouldn't say they overlooked us. They just felt like if we can muscle them around. And it, it was a weird thing in game one. Um, Juan Pierre gets a bunt base hit. Uh, Luis Castillo gets a blue base hit. Juan goes to third, and then Pudge Rodriguez sack flies them in. That happened with all of four minutes. So the fans were like, what the hell? They're down one to nothing already? Like, I just got my popcorn. So we knew if we forced our style of play on them that they were going to have difficulties. But it was a fun series. Um, I learned how to drink hard alcohol during that series just because the stress level of it, being a part of it. But, uh, no, nah, you know, uh, you know, win or lose, you're you're always blessed to be a part of those type of experiences. Hey, Dottrell, it's Juan. Uh, I, I have to follow up on you because uh, you, you mentioned a, a favorite of mine, Lima Time. And you said that you pattern yourself around Lima Time. I, I got to ask you because I don't think uh, enough fans take into this into account with starting pitching. You guys warm up in the bullpen before the game. You're pitching the game. You're throwing pitches in the inning, in between innings. I mean, that that's a lot of work already. But Lima Time was so high energy. How do you balance all that energy you're wasting just being like animated and pumped into it and not get tired out? I mean, is it better just to be cool, calm, and collective? Or, I mean, I love when players are able to show their emotions and stuff like that. I think that's good for baseball. But you also have a lot of old timers or a lot of red asses who are just like, hey, play the game right, you know, show no emotions. And I'm not talking about Madison Gar Baumgartner, all right, for you guys <laughs> listening at home. There are other red asses. But, I mean, has anyone ever told you, hey, dude, relax, take it easy. You're going to wear yourself out. No, not at all. I mean, the one thing that uh, Jose did is in the background, and a lot of fans don't see, a, a, a ton of pitchers work their tails off. Like, you know, they run poles. They run up and down the stadium when the stadium's closed. They do whatever they can do to make sure they can throw 130, 150 pitches to go out there and win a big league baseball game. But, you know, you know, sports, you have to play to your personality. And Jose was – if you saw Jose in the locker room – Jose used to come in the opposing team's uh, locker room, which that's unheard of, and just start talking to everybody. Like, And no one cared because they just loved him and his energy, and he loved the pitch. He wanted to send the fans a message – that I'm enjoying what I'm doing in front of you. And so that's why it was so refreshing to even just to play against them. You know, I mean, and when you're a guy that can put Lima time on your seats in your car and no one says anything, that I mean, you earned that right. You know what I mean? So he was always a good guy. God rest his soul. Um, but, you know, again, I was the same person. You know what I mean? I, I wanted to go out there and show everybody that I was having a good time. Um, I never took one pitch for granted. I've always enjoyed the experiences. I always enjoyed getting booed and my ass kicked in Dodger Stadium. So that's why if you can't beat them, you join them, as you can see, you know. But uh, no, I, I, I love all the experiences, man. And so, you know, it, Madison Bumgarner, you know, he's wound that way. So that's why he pitches that way. That's what got him to the big leagues, and that's what made him successful in the big leagues. You know, Clayton Kershaw, you know, he's a happy guy, but when it's his day to pitch, he's very intense. So whatever it takes to make yourself successful and, and, and be true to yourself, that's what you have to do. So, I, I mean, I, I know Alonso had brought this up before, but is it true that Lima Time was a singer? Did he have, like, his own band or a nightclub act or something like that? He, he, he did it all, man. Like, you know what I mean? That, that's the joy of him because, like, he, he, he was non-apologetic of who he was. And, you know, a lot of people in this world are envious because we all try to put cloaks and, and shells. And it's like, it was just nice to see. And when he sang the national anthem, it was absolutely beautiful. It's one of the best viral things you have to look up if you see him sing the national anthem because he was begging to sing the national anthem. And so, it, you know, again, you know, you, you, you love those personalities because everybody in your friend group has a Jose Lima. Everybody in a neighborhood has a Dontra Willis. Like, you're like, look at this guy. Like, how the hell did he get to the big leagues looking like that and throwing like that? So I think when you're relatable to a lot of people, I, I, I think you make fans out of people as well. Uh, before I throw it over to Alicia, we're speaking with uh, Dodger broadcaster and Sportsnet LA uh, analyst, Dontrell Willis. Dontrell, um, since you did pitcher on pitcher crime, on Lima time and, and, and hit that, that grand slam. You had mentioned about he was tipping his pitches. 
Mm -hmm. I mean, you're a pitcher and you're figuring that out. Did you have more of an advantage of that because you know what to look for? Or do the players, I mean, we hear it a lot. Famously, we heard it with you, Darvish, in the 2017. I mean, how common is it for pitchers to tip pitches during a game? Um, Very common because as a human, you have triggers to get yourself in an element to where you can be successful. But you don't realize that you're doing it. You know, and so... Um, uh my era was a lot of people when they wanted to throw a breaking ball they would move their finger that was out the glove and they would give an indicator that oh my god he's trying to get his grip to the breaking ball just little nuances that give away something and like i remember facing jose lima and i when he went up uh when he wanted to throw a change up his glove was very close to his hands before he broke and then when he wanted to throw a fastball i could see daylight in between the glove and his chest and once I picked that up and I started to guess right in there back, I went straight in the dugout. I was like, I got him. And everybody's like, what? What is it? And then he had difficulty. Now, he doesn't realize that he's doing this and it's a mechanical flaw. But after that, he had a very difficult time. And that's why I was able to get the grand slam because our whole team was on him. Because now they're like, oh, either a ball or it's something I can hit with the fastball. So it's very it's very prevalent in sports you know you hear about it in poker where guys kind of get nervous and they twitch when they got a good hand or, or what I, what have you so you know it, it's just a human nature and, and if you can pick up on somebody and get the advantage you know most most likely or not you're going to take advantage of it and there you have it that's how don trell ended jose lima's career ladies and gentlemen oh, don't do that don't do so, that <laughs> go, go ahead alicia <laughs> dang um, hi. Hey, it's pitcher on pitcher crime. I'm just telling you. <laughs> um, and how I'm going to take it, I'm going to stick with the violence and uh, <laughs> backpedal to something you just mentioned, which I loved hearing. Dantrell, you mentioned that at Dodger Stadium, you got booed and you got your ass kicked. And mm -hmm. I'm all about that. You know, yeah, I heard yeah. <laughs> born and raised. So I love hearing that because I want to ask your opinion as part of the Dodgers broadcasting team, uh, Spectrum, you know, Sportsnet LA. There is a recent, I don't know, kind of like surge or so a nationally syndicated sports show just gave out their list of the top sports teams. Uh, a top TV analyst just gave out the best sports fans and LA is never on the list. And it's, you know, Boston, New York, Philadelphia. So now that you're part of the team and not just on the field at a stadium, especially Dodger Stadium, which is the cathedral of baseball, in my opinion, um, can we give some love to the town that is Los Angeles, the fans, the Dodger fans? I'm, I Honest opinion, because I know you keep it real. Are we Fairweather fans the way someone just said on ESPN? Won't mention any names. <laughs> no, nah, I mean, first of all, I'm from California. Um, if you're from the West and, you know, Colorado, Arizona, Dodger Stadium is a cathedral of baseball for young baseball players. Everybody wants to go to Dodger Stadium. And I'm from Northern California, you know what I mean? And so we're cousins, you know, in that sense of Northern <laughs> and Southern where, you know, we might have a little rivalry, but it's all love when we need to have it love when it's come together as a statewide thing. But, you know, it's a great honor to be able to play in Dodger Stadium. I remember all my starts. Um, I just golfed uh, yesterday with Nomar Garcia Parra, who's on our staff at Sportsnet as well, who hit a home run off me to take the lead in the sixth or seventh inning. So that was fun to talk about with him in the cart. But, uh, you know, um, I always enjoyed Dodger Stadium. I've always enjoyed the fans. The fans are very knowledgeable. But like the city, um, the city is built on there's no second place. And that's a good thing. Like, you know what I mean? It's an element of, like, either you win. Uh, we ain't talking about no division titles. We're talking about world titles. And every generation of people that live in Los Angeles has had the Showtime Lakers and, and, and you know, Dodger baseball. And they, and they talk about the history of this, how the teams brought L.A. together. And that's the one thing that's cool about being part of the Dodger staff. You know, some people are Lakers fans. Some people are Clippers fans, you know, Raiders fans, Rams fans. But the Dodgers unite L.A. I, I firmly believe that, like, you know what I mean? So, and, and when summertime comes around and the weather's beautiful, I mean, there's no better place than being at Dodger Stadium. So, you know, I, I feel great honor to be a part of a staff that, you know, uh, that's part of the uh, booth that Vin built 
you know, so I, I take it very personally. I take a, a huge responsibility of that. So um, it's just fun, man. It, it, it's a blessing. I can honestly say I've been on Fox nationally for eight years, and I've been with the Dodgers one year, and I've gotten just as much love. Like around the city, people appreciate, and, and people are very uh, critical of me as well. I, I love all of that, you know what I mean, because it, it, it's a California thing. You're going to get brutal, brutally honest with you know your analysts and brutally honest with your fans but that could also be a uh east coast bias thing you know i mean they're already in bed by the time dodger stadium <laughs> is rocking and, you know what i mean i so you know i lived in miami so i can see how that could be a bias thing where that's late in ball games but they're just uh hating on la because la just gets everything man so that i think that's what that is see and i love that and i do know that there is an east coast bias and it is a late you know, to watch the games, you have to stay up late. But I also think we get punished, LA fans, because we have options. And you just laid out all the options. We have great weather. We have multiple teams that win in multiple sports, right? And we just keep growing. So I'm all for that bias. As I guess I should worry when they stop hating, right? Right. <laughs> that's that's mm -hmm. what I'll, I'll focus on. Um, and speaking of, I know that you are a Northern California guy. Mm -hmm. uh, shout out to Alameda. Um, mm -hmm. I'm actually in San Luis Obispo right now. Okay. Uh, it's a thing with my dad, Father's Day thing. Speaking of my dad, he is the reason that I have this beautiful relationship with baseball. We love the Dodgers, okay? I know you're a girl dad. You have four mm -hmm. daughters. And yeah. <laughs> do they feel the same way about baseball? Do any of them play sports? Are any of them trying to follow in your footsteps? What's happening? Nah, hell no. Uh, actually, <laughs> um, no, not at all. Uh, uh, one plays soccer out in Irvine. Uh, I'm so proud of her. Uh, flies back and forth. Uh, one of the top soccer players uh, in the Southwest region. Another one plays volleyball. Uh, uh, they all collect, the ones in cheer, they all collectively get on my nerves evenly, but I love and adore them. Um, but they were younger when I played in the big league, so they, you know, the two older ones kind of remember it, but they remember more of the mascots and the food more than daddy <laughs> pitching. So, you know, I, I think I've done a good job as a father, um, you know, this, you know, telling them to make their own path. But I think now as they get older, they, they enjoy seeing me on television, you know, saying the same goofy lines I say at home uh, and what have you. But uh, no, uh, uh, when they look at baseball and they look at fans come at me, they think it's kind of weird because I'm just their dad. And so I think that's more of the, just the fandom of like, those people know you, dad. And like, you know, so they, they're, they're starting to take all of that in. My second oldest daughter, they call her B-Train, and she loves it. She eats it all up, you know what I mean? She has B-Train on her cleats, and she wears number 35. And I'm like, baby, you need to set your bar a little bit higher than your father, you know what I mean? But, uh, you know, I'm very proud of them. Um, they're smart, beautiful young girls, and uh, they don't look like their dad. So I thank God that I pay a lot in tithes and offerings when I go to church. Oh, I love that. I love that. And any broadcasting uh hopes for them any do they want to be on television like dad yeah they like that part of it i think it's want to be famous they, they just want to be famous like yeah this, this generation they just want to be TikTok famous and you know what i mean be well known and you know i i was at a i was at a pool with them and that you know my two older daughters are all google-eyed and you know as a father you're like what are you looking at you know what i mean and they're like that's the boy on TikTok, and i'm like oh god i can't deal i cannot deal with my life right now so you know they did they, they enjoy it i think my oldest is starting to get into it and just uh, like watching me prepare uh for shows you know because i take a lot of pride in just taking a lot of information uh for the dodgers and as well as for fox sports but they they're, they're, they're too busy uh shopping at lululemon to kind of think about that <laughs> stuff right now <laughs> Oh, boy. Well, thank you. Thank you for being with us today. I'm going to pass it on to one of my co-hosts. Uh, Dontro Willis, uh, Los Angeles Dodgers slash Sportsnet LA broadcaster joining us. Real quick, before we talk about the Dodgers as a pitcher, I have to ask you this because, as you know, we, we are, are, are again, I'm talking about batting. Uh, you once were seventh in the lineup, in a big league lineup, and that was the first time that that had happened since something like 1973. Uh, how much shit did the guys give you that day? Because anything you and I both know about a clubhouse, those guys are going to give you shit. 
It was the only time where I looked in the lineup and I think Mike Mordecai was hitting behind me and someone else, and I did not like it at all. I did not <laughs> like it. I didn't like it. I was tight. I was pissed because, one, I'm worried about this, you know, my start, but I was hitting the ball so well. I, I didn't want to make those guys feel small. I didn't want the manager to make those guys feel small. We're all a team. You know, I need these yeah. guys. And it didn't help that I got to hit that damn night either. So, I mean, it, it, it was nuts, but – I, I I probably that might have been the only time I ever talked to a manager like saying like please don't put me in that position again and he understood but he said it was more so just trying to get those guys fired up to do their job a little bit better and, and, and so but uh, you know I I was not happy about that that day but uh, I think we won the ball game so that's all that matters hundred percent well as as we've talked about this and and you know apparently the sky's falling with the Dodgers I <laughs> I'm still optimistic that they're going to turn it around because obviously you know as, as Dave has said himself Dave Roberts uh this team is too good to struggle this way right and as you know baseball cyclical you know there's there's patches rough patches and all that but obviously with pitching at the moment there's a lot of injuries and and you kind of have to weather that storm but the Dodgers have the depth um, and that's you know kind of the thing that sets the Dodgers aside from kind of everyone, right? Um, from your position, you know, as a guy that that had success in the major leagues, knows what it takes to pitch in the major leagues, you kind of see this this I, I don't want to call a merry-go-round at this point, but you know you see a lot of guys coming up and down, right? Is it fair to say it is the injuries and kind of these guys having to do spot starts and stuff like that, or is there something else that we're overlooking and, and just kind of being cynical since we are spoiled Dodger fans? Um, that's a great question. Um, first of all, you know, and I say this on air, um, the other team, they drive nice cars too. And so, yeah, you know, like this is, this is a division that you knew going in, you know, I, I believe all five managers were manager of the year at one point. Yeah. So these are going to be world coach teams. And so, you know, you saw it. I, I heard the first inkling when the Diamondbacks took two or three from the Dodgers and everybody's like, Oh no. And then all of a sudden they blew them out. For the next seven games you know what i mean and then uh you know the next series was uh philly came in the dodger stadium and blew the pitching staff up like they scored like 40 runs against them they couldn't you know they couldn't stop them from scoring they go to philadelphia and they crush them yeah you know and then they crush them and so it it's one of those things where every championship team deals with adversity and the only thing that will I feel like on paper that's going to stop the Dodgers is injury. Now, the depth is there. Um, the trust is there. Glad to see Clayton Kershaw back in the mound. But you, you also are getting contributions from guys you not necessarily saw coming. Tony Gosselin has turned. I mean, he might be able to start the All-Star game in his own damn stadium. I mean, he's been absolutely outstanding. Tyler Anderson is trying to throw a no-hitter. I mean, you could tell, by the way, when they're doing interviews, they're like, uh, I don't even know what to say because I can't even believe I'm doing this stuff right now. You know what I mean? Like, it, it, it's fun to see him do that. Um, all the credit to Mark Pryor, um, best pitching coach in the league. Uh, really blessed to, to, to talk to him and be around him. He's had success like me, and we've dealt with adversity. And I think he's very forthcoming about game planning, and he has a great sense of when a guy is struggling on the mound because we've been there. So, I mean, he's been absolutely outstanding. And again, you know, when you're the Dodgers, you're going to get everybody's best fight. You're everybody's World Series. So whenever they have a mental lapse, it, it, it shows. You know, like it, it, when you play the Giants, that's a rivalry. So if you don't get the little things done, they're going to be able to win those ball games, especially in their own ballpark. I mean, so it, it, it's good. It's all a good thing for this organization to deal with things because it's going to make those guys in the locker room closer and learn how to deal with adversity better. So they're just they're just fine. They're absolutely fine. You know, I mean, they're, they're, they're going to win the division and they're going to go deep in the playoffs. And I still believe that they're going to represent the National League in the World Series. And you you actually uh, uh, teed me up for the the question that I've because I, I want to talk to Mark Pryor on this show. I'm going to be honest. No no offense mm -hmm. to you or anyone else. That's no, uh, okay. <laughs> but, but a part of the reason. I hey Don Joe, can you get Mark to do the show for us? Yeah. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. <laughs> but a, I think he's a little busy right now. Yeah, I was going to say he's a little busy. <laughs> but but the reason I want to talk to Mark Pryor is to find out what the hell did he do to become this pitching guru that's been able to find you know obviously the Dodgers have found diamonds in the rough right you know you got your Max Muncy's you got your Justin Turner's you got your Chris Taylor's but with pitching holy cow man I mean Rick no offense to Rick Honeycutt Rick Honeycutt is one of the best 
one of the best coaches in, in the history of the game. But Mark Pryor has taken it up a, a next level. Yancy Almonte, who I, I uh, last year told these guys too, the Dodgers should go acquire that guy. You know, because he has the stuff. He just needed, you know, to, to tinker a couple things. And the, Mark tinkered a couple of those things, and look how good that dude has been. And then Tyler Anderson, no offense to Tyler Anderson, but has completely come out of left field and just changed everything up. What is Mark Pryor doing that that just no one else can figure out with some of these guys? Well, you know, being part of the Dodgers organization, I'm a special assistant to the farm director, Will Rhymes, which I'm still trying to figure out what the hell that means. But they let me in the parking <laughs> lot, so that's all that matters and stuff. But Rick Honeycutt, first of all, is still around and still heavily involved in the pitching analytics side. The Dodgers do a beautiful blend of being able to when the analytics and in people that have experiences i mean it, it is truly remarkable i mean charlie huff's on the staff i mean he's got 250 wins i mean he's pitching against barry bonds and babe Ruth. i mean the experiences of guys that have done it at the highest level you can't pay for that so the hiring of bringing a don Charles willis and having a rick honeycutt and guys like that and also the analytics side the players buy into that Look, Almonte, if your sinker runs, we're going to target you in the middle of the plate. So when you watch Almonte come out of the bullpen, he's, you know, Wills is sitting middle because he's giving him the whole plate for the ball to run go side. You know, other organizations, they sit him on the outside, then that's ball one, ball two, ball eight, ball nine, and now he's out of the game. So is this the mental smarts to be able to convey the message and getting guys to be able to ball uh, to buy in. I mean, even Phillips out of the bullpen. You know, he comes from Tampa, and then all of a sudden he comes here, and he's he's the lockdown seventh, eighth inning guy. You know what I mean? And, and, and his stuff didn't change. It was just about the mentality of how his stuff plays to the hitter, and that's why Mark Pryor is absolutely outstanding. Every time you've seen the pitcher start to go away, his mound visit game is 100%. He always knows when to go out there and be like, look, let's calm it down a little bit. You know, you're one pitch away. And, they're, and, they're, and he's well respected. He's well respected. And people are still on that team old enough to remember Mark Pryor as a kid where he was prime Mark Pryor and one of the best pitchers in the game. So, you know, this Dodgers staff, I mean, listen, I'm honored to be around them because it, it's one of the elite staffs in baseball. And and with that, uh, one thing, you know, talking about giving someone their flowers, I, I am, I would say, in my humble opinion, I conduct the don't fuck with Dave Roberts train because <laughs> we're, we're so, we're so blessed to have that guy uh, running the ship. But man, people, people really like they call for his head all the time and I get it. It's Twitter, you know, the cesspool that's Twitter and all that stuff. But for those, you know, you see it day in and day out. How lucky is this organization to have a guy like Dave Roberts? You know, I, I'm going to take you in a day of Dave Roberts, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm on the outside looking in and I'm, I'm getting myself ready for to be a part of this organization. And I just go around and say hello to everybody. And Hey, Skip, what's going on? Hey, D train, this is what we're going to do. We're going to set up the bullpen. We're going to like, wow, like he is on it. Like, you know what I mean? And so the standard for him, he takes it personal. He's a successful ball player and winner. And he understands what that, what's at stake. And if you're a manager in, in New York or LA, it doesn't matter what you're doing. Everyone's calling your head. <laughs> it's, it's just part of the business. It's just the nature of it. No, everyone's not going to enjoy what you're doing. But I think he's handled this run uh, superbly. I, I, I think you know the pressures of being a Dodger when they don't. Sustain. He's very brutally honest, and I and I love that comment that he said about like we're too good to not get this done with bases loaded twice in 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 in, the, in Giants you know ballpark. It's like we were good enough to get this done. So. I, I love that standard. He lets everybody play loose. He lets everybody have fun. But he disenjoys being a part of it and, and taking the responsibility. And that's why he said what he said in his spring training. He said, we're going to be the World Series champs. I welcome the smoke. I, I, I want our club to say, hey, we're going to be victorious at the end. So when you set that type of standard for yourself and for your ball club, the sky's the limit. Alicia, you want to go ahead and uh, ask that question that you had? Oh, yeah. I just wanted to circle back when you were mentioning Gonsolin and the fire that is his. He's just so amazing. And I could not be happier for the cat man. Don't say nothing, baby face. We won't even talk about <laughs> <laughs> um, 
but we, we we are getting excited right collectively los angeles is starting to you know get worked up for the all-star game that will be here soon it's coming up who do you think will be representing the dodgers and who do you think should be representing the dodgers in the game wow um that's a great question well first with tony goslin i asked him a question um when i first got to meet him in person I said, do you think you start, uh, spot starting those games in the bubble helped you prepare to be a better pitcher on the mound? And he said, absolutely. You know, that was a tough situation. And I don't think Dodger fans really, and no disrespect to Dodger fans, but as a pitcher, you can only lose that game. You can't win that game because he's, they're not allowing him to go deep in that ball game. But for him to go out there in, in a tough situation, un in a bubble and go out there and throw strikes and give the team a chance and really set the bullpen up that was everything and i think it started to propel his confidence as a ball player and as a pitcher he always had good stuff it was just about putting it all together but now you're starting to see the mound presence the things that you see from walker bueller the things that you see from clayton kershaw when they're on the mound it's their day and they're the dog you know what i mean so it's fun to see a guy do that and get the development the beard's getting bigger you know what i mean the, the, the cat man is getting bigger on him and so and he's needed now and, and 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 i know a little bit about that being able to go from we hope to we need and they need him right now to continue to be one of the best pitchers in the game and he will be oh as far as the all-star i'm sorry as far as the all-star um damn i mean Mookie, Freddie, Tyler, half the bullpen. I mean, it, it's too many guys. Like, it, 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 it's too many. It, it, they're, they're, they're just so deep. I, I, I mean, it, it, it's, it's, it's fun to watch, but they're going to go on another run. They're going to go on another run where they win, you know, seven, eight in a row quietly. And, and they, you know, they're, they're, they're going to be fine. But I, I think they're going to have five or six all-stars in that lineup. Nice. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> hey, hey, Dontrell, so you just said something that I try to stress on this show as much to everybody. You know, it's like, hey, no pasa nada. Everything is going to be fine. It's a long season. But one thing that did surprise me was after that San Francisco series, when Dave Roberts called out the team, right? And I didn't think what he said was even that bad. It wasn't anything to be over dramatic. But I did, it seemed a little out of character for him, you know, because he is kind of like a Phil Jackson type where, you know, he's even keeled. But have you ever had a situation in the dugout, if you hear that, because to me, I don't think there's anybody on that team that's being selfish. It's really hard for me to sit there and say, Freddie Freeman is a selfish player when you see him trying to go the opposite field every time. Trey Turner is leading the team in RBIs and comes up with big hit after big hit. I don't see a selfishness there. So is that just really, you mentioned this before, that the manager was just trying to fire up the other guy. Is this just a tactic to try to get these guys to snap out of whatever funk they were in in San Francisco? Well, it worked. <laughs> First and foremost, <laughs> they come down there and, and Angels and they beat the brakes off the Angels and, you know, all, all is well. But listen, I mean, it, it, it's difficult to manage yourself. It's another monster when you have to manage 26 stars in L.A. But I don't think he was – I think the way he worded it kind of was triggering, but I understood what he meant. Like, if a pitcher is having trouble throwing strikes, I don't want you chasing out of the zone. And the situation that he's talking about is, you know, the base is loaded, you know, then Garcia and Duvall come out, and they struck Mookie out with a slider that wasn't close. Well, I think he means selfishly like you want to beat them yourself and knock the guy in instead of just taking the walk. So I don't think it was an attack. And I don't I know for sure the players didn't take it as an attack of being selfish in that sense. It's like, I just want to be the hero. It's like, no, allow our lineup that's constructed to say, hey, the next man up if I don't get my pitch, you know, and so. Uh, you know, and when you're an athlete, you want to be the hero. It's a natural thing to go out there and be the guy that that, that writes the shit. But it's all a, a, a lesson not only for Dave Roberts, or, you know, who got a couple new pieces, but for the ball club to be like, hey, man, this is the only way that teams are going to beat us, getting us to chase out of the zone. And up until that series, the Dodgers were the best at not chasing out of the zone in all of baseball. You had to beat them in the strike zone. So – to see them uncharacteristically chasing balls out of the zone because the moment got too big to them 
you know, you, you, you oftentimes against a rival, you, you, you're going to be upset about it. But so far, so good. It was a good pep talk. So as long as they keep winning after that Dodgers series, I think we'll, we'll forget about it. You know, one of the things that I, I find really interesting, and I don't think this is necessary, but the fact that reporters are allowed to go into the locker room after the game and ask questions to athletes after they they just lost the game. It's a key to the moment. They're pissed. And you're going to ask them a question about why you lost that game. Wait, look, we all watched the game. We know why they lost the game. So here's an example. Trey Turner on Sunday has to ask the question, why didn't you score from first on, on that signal? Uh, on that single, right? Look, I don't blame Trey Turner for having the reaction that he did. He's probably pissed. They just got swept. And guess what, man? Are you perfect every day? Every once in a while, you have a brain fart. It's not like he wasn't trying to score on purpose. Has there ever been an occasion for you after a game where you got a reporter sticking their microphone in your face asking you a question and it just triggers you and you just have to do everything in your power not to just go off on the guy? Um, no, because I'm my hardest critic. So there's okay. nothing that you can say to me that I, I don't say to myself, especially, you know, on a golf course now that I'm learning to try to find my zen, you know what I mean? But, uh, <laughs> uh, no, no, I mean, but at the same time, we're all human. We're, we're, we're all human. Like, we've all had to apologize after a, a snapping, if you will, and especially when you're putting all your efforts to be successful and you fail. And so it's it's upsetting, but... No, you know, you know, as far as the media, you know, they're an outlet to, you know, to the fans and the fans, you know, pay the salary. So, you know, it's all it's all a balance with that. You know what I mean? And, and I was always very good about being brutally honest uh, about things, especially when I struggle. But no, I mean, at the same time, you know, as long as you're not disrespectful and you're putting hands on people, you know, what I mean, if, if you're upset, like sometimes you want to see that human emotion because now it shows the fans that you care. It's not just, oh, I'm going to, you know, brush my hair, take a shower and go in my $100,000 vehicle and not care. Like, no, I care about this. I, I want to be successful, you know, for myself and for my ball club and for the, the city that I represent. So I don't mind it. I like seeing guys fired up, you know what I mean, and, and, and snapping. As long as it's not every damn day where it gets stressful, you know what I mean? Like, but, you know, I, I, I love when guys play, play with passion. Now, Trey Turner, I, I saw that play. I think he was just caught in where the ball was and didn't know that he was having the round second and rounding third. So, but again, you know, and, and yes, he's one of the fastest, but like I said, when I see Mookie drop a ball, it's like, do you get on him? No, hell no, because he's going to score when he's going to let up. So, you know what I mean? I'm not, I'm not going to sit there and, and debate that with Mookie Betts. And, and I had a chance to tell him that one time. And so they, these are the Dodger fans are, are blessed that, this is the best roster constructed and i know being a little bit part of the you know around the front office that all they care about is winning they are involved in winning they just it, it doesn't matter what they're spending i mean let's keep it real 270 million is a lot of chips with them and so they're committing themselves to be like i don't care what it takes as long as we have a parade in los angeles that's all that matters and so, you know, emotions are going to run high, not only in the front office, but the coaching staff, but with the players as well. You know, I'm going to follow up because you just set up Alicia for one with what you said in the sense that the fans pay your salary. How, I'm curious as to how, you know, conscious players are uh, of that. But Alicia, you know where I'm going with this. Go ahead and ask them about the booing. I, I'm very curious to hear what a, former players or players think about the fans booing. Go ahead, Alicia. You're on mute. You're on mute, Alicia. I've been talking about, <laughs> A, you are so right how spoiled we are. A or B, we love how competitive the Dodgers are. But I also remember the years we were not, and I still went to those games, the McCourt years. So when we do have such an amazing product, right, on the field and the depth. You've talked about all of that, Don Chow. And when I see and hear fans next to me at Dodger Stadium booing our players, I get triggered. I don't like it. I don't think it's not helpful. We've had other guests uh, on the Carne Asada say the same thing. It's not helpful. They're human, which you alluded to just a few moments ago. Baseball players are human, and we shouldn't you know, worry when Mookie drops the ball or whatnot. But is it okay? Was it ever okay when you were a player, and now that you're 
an analyst watching the game from up top, you know, is it okay to boo the players? I mean, and is it effective? Does it help? Because it's not, it's not a thing in LA. Let me stress that. It's known, you know, Philly fans, New York fans. We are LA. We're sunshine. Why am I wrong or am I making a big deal out of this? No, no. I mean, you know, it, it's weird. I, when I struggled uh, in my later career in Detroit, I was booed and cheered at the same time. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I was booed in the first and then cheered in the fifth. I was like, hey, forget y'all now. Like, I don't want to talk to you. <laughs> you know what I mean? No, no but you know, <laughs> I, 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 again, the, they don't get to where they get playing with and against the best players in the world without having their own standard within. So booing to us is just noise. You know what I mean? We know if I got a six ERA, I know I suck. I don't need you to yell at me to tell me I suck. Like I know I'm trash. Like, you know what I mean? And so like we don't we we know we understand, but at the same time, you know, you, you can't have it both ways. Me as a fan, and I'm a diehard Raiders fan. I love Derek Carr, but when he misses a third down throw, I want to kill him. Like, you know what I mean? It's just a natural thing. It's just a natural thing. Like, you know what I mean? It's just a natural thing as a fan because fan is short for fanatic. So, you know what I mean? It, and listen, I live in L.A. now when I work, you know, with Fox. Listen, that traffic is so ridiculous. Like, I'm booing too. Like, you know how long it took me to get in this stadium and, and how, how long it's going to take me to get off this, you know, stadium parking lot and all that stuff. So, I, I, I see both sides of it, but you know it, it's it's all part of the game. It's all it's all part of the game. The, the, the Dodger fans cheer. It's funny because when the Dodger fans are, uh, when the Dodgers on the road and teams try to boo them, their fans oh the, the blue wave just overcomes that. The noise and the cheers just come. I mean, I call games in Pittsburgh. There was a sea of blue there. Chicago, Wrigley, they took over that. Arizona, they take over that. I called it a. Uh, Chavez Ravine Southwest, you know, what I mean? because it was, it was more Dodger fans than it was, you know, Diamonds fan, Diamondback fans in the stadium as well. But I don't think it's something that really bothers the players that much. And there you have it, folks, ladies and gentlemen. Finally, we have another real NFL football fan here. The autumn wind is a pirate, Dontrell. The Raiders. That's the only Raiders fan on this show right here. Next year's our year. We're doing it, man. All We're I doing heard, it. All I heard there is the years of abuse that have come out. You can't hurt me. I'm a Raiders fan, dude. You That's can't hurt me. Say whatever you want. Like I love, oh, I love, Devontae, I love Devonte Adams. I love him, and I wish nothing but the best for him. But when he said what he said about Derek Carr, I was like, "Oh, that man, this guy, this guy, like, come on, come on, how are you gonna, come on, come listen, on." Li listen, we we we've dealt with a lot of pain, and I've been a fan <laughs> since Napoleon Kaufman. Oh wow. I, I, I'm a fan. Like, I, my, me and my mother, we're diehard fans, and we don't speak to each other until Wednesday, especially if they lose. So, you know, <laughs> I, 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 I I got a chance to meet Patrick Mahomes. And I gave him a fist pound, and I told him straight, I said, I'm a diehard Raiders fan. I respect you, but I'm a diehard, so I can't shake your hand, man. The hood won't let me shake your hand, brother. So, and, he, and he respected it. He understood. He respected it. But, yeah, I, I love the Raiders no matter where they're at. Nice. I, uh I wanted to ask you, so you you have the privilege of working, in my opinion, with with probably the best broadcast team in all of baseball. You have Joe Davis, you got Oral Hershiser. You know, I feel like that's the best combo. But but you, you've you've come in, you know, it's your first year. You know, I loved everything you did uh, with with Fox and uh, the, the even the rapport with you and like Poppy and, and, and all that. It, it was great, right? Um, but then you come over to this side and you got, you know, Jessica Mendoza, Nomar, Garcia Parra, you got, you know, you got a whole, you got a murderer's rope, you know, for lack of a better mm -hmm. term. I mean, obviously we can't, we can't leave out uh, the guy that, uh, that, that carries the team in his mind, Jerry Hairston. Um, <laughs> we, 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 uh, shout out to Jay Hair, by the way. Um, but you, you know, you've gotten a lot of praise, you know, a lot of people have, have been, have been digging what you're doing and let's, let's be honest, man, calling a game is hard. It, it, a lot of people don't realize how difficult that is. Uh, what, what's the transition been like for you and, and how are you taking the fanfare? Uh, well, first and foremost, I'm very appreciative. I can honestly say this and I, I haven't said this publicly, but the night before my first game call, it hit me and I was like, oh shit, this is the house that Vin built. Like this is, this, this is big. This is, this is something 
that's important not only for my career as an analyst and a broadcaster, but you know, to the fans in the market. And I literally started thinking of like all the cities, like Santa Monica, Pasadena, like you know, East LA. I'm like, oh my God, it's gonna be like nine million people watching. Like, you know what I mean? Because you know, it's a, it's important. And I, I understood how passionate Dodger fans are. Joe Davis is the best. Um, does an awesome job preparing. Eric Carroll, who I work with at Fox, who I owe a lot to getting this job over here at Sportsnet, one of the most well-respected guys, or her size is Oral. He's the bulldog. You know what I mean? Like he, He's someone that's very passionate about the Dodgers, has a lot of cachet. And when you have cachet, you're like, hey, I got some stock in this, man. I care about the product, and I want to see them successful. So I think, you know, Sportsnet and the Dodgers did a phenomenal job uh, – just putting together well-rounded people that love the sport and, and really are passionate about the Dodgers. So, and I think that shows on air and uh, it's been fun, man. It, it, it's been truly a blessing um, just talking to people and even taking some of their opinions of things they don't like, you know what I mean? My heart don't bleed no lemonade. So when people don't <laughs> like something, you know, I, I, I'm willing to hear it as long as it's respectful. So, you know, it, it, it's been fun, man. And, and I'm honored and I, I get to get all this free Dodger gear now. And they're like, everyone's like, you're a homer now. I'm like, that's right, baby. I lay all day. I lay all day. I'm down, baby. Yeah, so it's a good group. And uh, we feed off each other. And I think that shows on air. I, I also feel like I, we were talking about this uh, off air in our group text. I feel like Eric Carroll's kind of gets criticized unfairly, you know, as far as, you know, just anything he kind of says because he's good the dude's good you know and, and i and, and i kind of wanted to hear from you since you work with the guy you were giving him his flowers a second ago do you would you also agree that that criticism's unfair or is it one of those I, and i understand too again we've talked about this dodger fans are spoiled they got to nitpick something right so so i feel like to a certain degree with with caro's stuff is being nitpicked is it fair to say that Absolutely, but that's what we do in California. <laughs> you know, we nitpick <laughs> everything, so that's just a natural state. But also, again, that's what I mean by spoiled. Vince Scully is one of the best all time of, in sports history, not just baseball history, in sports history. And to have him around that long, I mean, I, I heard a playback from Vin where he knew where my mama worked. He knew all this information. I was just so impressed. So, you know, you kind of get spoiled with that. But as far as Eric Carroll's, he's clean. He's precise. He loves the Dodgers. He was a great Dodger. I mean, the home run leader for the Dodgers. And so I think for him, he, he loves the Dodgers so much. And he allows the game to just tell the story. You know, he doesn't speak a lot. You know what I mean? He doesn't narrate the game a lot. But... He's honest about what he sees out there. And so I love it. Listen, people talk trash to me all the time on Twitter. When I see that stuff about EK and he's the EK curse, I get effing pissed because it's like it's not the broadcaster's job to be hitting the cutoff man. We're just narrating the game here. You know what I mean? Like, so, and they get it. You know what I mean? Like, Dodger fans want, you know, every team wants to win every single day. And I get the fans want that as well. But Eric Carroll's and, and Joe Davis is, is the best. Oh, her size is the best, and so I, I've made a lot of li a lot of money being able to ride coattails, and I'm going to ride their coattail all the way to the top. <laughs> hey, and you know what? You get some free gear out of it too. So I mean, mm -hmm. a dub is a dub, right? Mm -hmm. We got to live. <laughs> and uh, and real quick too, shout out to the homie John Hartung, who we've had on. He's one of the absolute best. Uh, he also just is a pro's pro. Uh, and again, I cannot stress this enough. We are so spoiled on the field and off the field as Dodger fans from broadcast all the way down. It, it, it's unfair. This, this is, you know, John's doing his dream job. This yeah. is his dream to be able to do this. And you, let me tell you something. Out of all the analysts, and he's going to kill me for saying this, he's the most emotional about Dodger games. He is up. He is down. Like, it is It is amazing to see him, John. I have to be like, calm him down. Like, pretty bird, pretty bird, calm down, John. <laughs> calm down. Like, it's gonna. It's only the fourth inning, John. Like, you know what I mean? Like, but he's invested, and, and I'm invested. Like, and I have no shame on Fox, and, and people give me a lot of flack. If I have a top five, Dodgers. If I have a top five, Dodgers. Who's the best? Dodgers. I don't care. I'm a homer. I have no shame <laughs> in saying I'm, I'm a homer because you, when you're around the team and you're around these guys, um, 
you, you get to appreciate them and you get to love them and what they're trying to do and what they represent. But yeah, you're absolutely right. And, and, and that's what I mean about the group. I mean, to have John as a host and Jerry Harrison, who is a, is a ball of energy and, and, and loves the team as well. Everybody's truly invested in the ball club. And, and I think it shows on air. Dontro Willis, uh, Los Angeles Dodgers broadcaster, Sportsnet LA slash Sportsnet LA. Uh, Alicia, go ahead. No, I was just going to say nice. I love the love, the energy. You are my dad's favorite mm-hmm. new broadcaster to this <laughs> game. And my dad is one of those nitpicky fans that Juan was just talking about. You know, off with his head. It's the end of the world whenever we lose a series, which is rare. So I'm taking away from this time you spent with the Bleed Los podcast. Calmate, right? Mm-hmm. Everyone just calm down. It's going to be okay. Um when you do get to go travel to all these stadiums, I love your energy. I love that you're not afraid to call things out. Do you see the wave at any other stadiums? Because that's kind of been an ongoing theme with our podcast. Is the wave okay? When is it okay? Because it's really popular at Dodger Stadium. I didn't I didn't know it was a problem with the wave. I love the wave. Like I, I, I love the wave. I've been on the mound, and, and this is how crazy athletes are wound. I'm on the mound second and third in the fourth inning. I'm already losing. I'm like, oh shit, here we go again. Like, you know what I mean? And then all of a sudden I'm like, oh that's cool. They got the wave. Oh, that's pretty nice. Hey, you need to get up, man. Like, you know, it's it's, just, it's part of sports. You know what I mean? It, it, it's the beauty of it, man. And, and and getting everybody involved and it it's it is it cheesy, of course, but there's a lot of things we do that's very cheesy. So who cares? You know, no one's that cool in high school. So you know, uh, no, I think it. I think it's fine. No, uh, but I don't see it much um, on the road. And I, I've seen a couple of times where Dodger fans try to get it going, but they're like, "Nah, sit down, man. We tired, <laughs> y'all. You guys, you guys get all the good players. We, we're not. We're not working with y'all." But no, I don't mind the wave at all. I love it. I love it, <laughs> guys. It's about that time we talk about. Uh... Yeah, uh, we're gonna wrap things up here, Dontrell. Uh, before we end the show, the way we always end the show, though, I have a couple of rapid fire questions for you. Okay. So, what is the difference between Oakland and Alameda? When people ask you where you from, what do you say? I'm from both. Born really? In Oakland. I'm from both. Born in Oakland, and Alameda is a, a island city that emulates the Bay. Oh, okay. Good call. Uh, so, on, on the show here, look, we're three Mexican kids, right? So, for us, Julio Arias, we, we worship at the shrine of Julio Arias. That is our boy. There was a conversation I had before Mookie came to the Dodgers. When Mookie was acquired by the Dodgers, there was an African-American man who was older who said to me, he's like, finally, we have somebody that we can root for. This is Los Angeles. How is it that we went this long without having an African-American superstar uh, on the team? And it made me think, well, yeah, I mean, I'm a Dodger fan because of Valenzuela. And I know a lot of Asians. Hideo Nomo is still someone that's huge. I have always said that if the guys, instead of playing basketball or football, went to baseball, baseball would even be better than it already is. How do we get African-Americans to, to choose baseball over those other sports? Well, the and Dodgers, go ahead and speak for all of the African American community right now. That's right. <laughs> no, no, no. But I, that's that's something that I have stock in, and I've been very blessed to be a, a black ace, and that's uh, African American. That's won twenty games. There's only fifteen of us in baseball history, so I'm very proud to be a part of that club. But we have to go in the hood. It is the bottom line. We have to throw money into the hood. Baseball is expensive. Those bats are four hundred dollars. Trust me, I know. Like you know what I mean. Like it is not cheap to be able to get somebody a glove. So you need the ballparks, not only the, the, the parks, to be safe and to be fun to play at. And so it's a different element in the hood because I know this. You know, growing up in Oakland, like parks are not necessarily the safest place. We need to make those safe because they teach us how to play with each other and how to play sports at a high level. You know what I mean? So that's the first thing. The second thing is that the Dodgers are doing that and they're rebuilding fields in these you know neighborhoods that they feel like, oh, they will not come here. No, we're coming to East LA. We're, we're, we're coming to Compton. We're coming in those places. And, and, and I, you're already hearing about kids coming from these areas already being impactful in the big league. So it works, but you just have to put boots on the ground. That's awesome. Uh, so uh, 
one quick way i can't ha- have you on the show and not ask you about miguel cabrera because mm-hmm. like what this guy did he just got three thousand hits earlier this year 500 home runs is it even possible to say that this guy is underappreciated like there's not that many people that have done what that guy does and i feel he still doesn't get enough credit for being a great player i you're absolutely right he's uh the term i use about him is he's obnoxiously good it's obnoxious like it's just like it's one of those things where he is arguably one of the best right-handed hitters of all time and I think because the Tigers are on a downturn, if you will, that he's not getting the praise. And when they did make it to the playoffs, you know, they, you know, he didn't play as well as he wanted to. But this guy is a bad man, um, a savant in the box. And I don't think that's spoken enough of how smart he is in the box. And I, I think that's also um, a thing that goes with, you know, uh, Latino and African Americans. They don't really talk about the intellect as much in sports. You know what I mean? So he knows what's coming. He understands how hitters. Are, I mean, pitchers are going to attack him. But you know, you're seeing his personality come out, and people are starting to appreciate that more. So just seeing him smile and being a leader and, and what have you. And so I've been blessed to you know be a teammate of his for I feel like ten years and. One of the good guys in all, all, all of baseball. So, but none of us that know him is shocked that he got three thousand hits and five hundred home runs. Like that, that's how good he is. I mean, and that's weird to say, but we always knew in Double A that this guy's going to go to Hall of Fame. Like that's how good he's always been. Question: Because you're a lefty, I'm a lefty, but I don't throw left-handed because I was told that I couldn't do anything left-handed. So that's that's the irony. But uh, I wanted to ask you: Fernando Valenzuela's thirty-four is now retired. Obviously, you know, you know the impact that that dude had. You know the impact that he continues to have. Should the 34 be retired? Absolutely. Absolutely. What he did and the way he is spoke about till this day, the joy, the electricity that he brought to Los Angeles, um, and he was aware of the responsibility, a lot like Julio is today, of the Hispanic community and going out there and representing it. And, and and representation is important. And I guarantee that you will see another Julio Reyes because of Julio Reyes, a kid from Los Angeles or a kid from Mexico that saw him pitch. That's the beauty of sports, man. Like, you know what I mean? And dreams are cool, especially when they're positive. And so Julio wears a, a green and red glove. You know, a lot of my friends are Hispanic, so I understand the pride. You know what I mean? I, like, I grew up in a neighborhood. Fruitvale is mixed. You know, and Alameda is mixed with Hispanics and blacks, and we learn to get along with each other. You know, I ate tortillas with a cold hot dog and the, the whole <laughs> night. Like, you know what I mean? The whole night. Like, and, 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 and you learn to respect each other in that sense. But I'm, I'm always uh, – and I, I feel bad because I got to get a bunch of Julio Urias bobbleheads for my Mexican friends up north because they want them too. Uh, but <laughs> Fernando was for Fernando was everything to a lot of people, and not just Hispanics. He was everything to the city of Los Angeles, whites and blacks. And the way he he went about his business, and uh, when I was compared to him, I didn't like it at all because I knew I was like I don't hold a candle to that man in, in what he did. And so when I got a chance to meet him. Uh, shake his hand man I, I felt anointed you know because <laughs> you know what i mean the pride of la you know th- this man that did it uh for a long time and did it well no and and all, all truth right there Don't- so you know you're a dodger legend now just for the whole deep dish pizza episode <laughs> in in chicago so this question is right up your alley we're going to end the show the way we always end all our shows don trail here on the bleed Lows podcast we're we're about the dodgers we're about la but we're also about taco culture i mean when you come hang out with us we're inviting you to hang out at the carne asada so being that you have a culinary taste we need to know what is your favorite taco and where do you go in the city to get that taco Okay, so um, I, I'm in downtown, so I, I've never stayed in downtown before, but, you know, I'm a food truck guy. You know, I'm, I'm a foodie. So, you know, the carne asada tacos have always been my tacos, a little cilantro. But then for the first time two days ago, I had a Maria taco. Oh, my God. That was like, I was like, where have I been in my life? Like, the juice was running down my chin, and I was doing this. And the guy that made the tacos, he was laughing at me. He was like, yeah, Nago, you like that? I was like, hell, yeah. Like, where have I been at? Like, what, what? I'm slipping, 
bro. Like so, like and, and so, I don't know, man. I always like a carne asada taco, but that 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 Maria, I don't know. I don't know if I'm saying it right. I apologize if I'm not. But that taco is thunder. Like I I couldn't believe that. So uh, we gonna have to. You have to call me back on that one because that that taco was fire. All right, uh, Trell. Now you, that you're a friend of the carne asada, we're gonna help you out here. It's birria, and I'm just okay. curious. There is a taco. There's a truck right, uh, right down um, Cesar Chavez, right over off of Vin Scully Way, out of the stadium. It's called Teddy's yeah. Red Tacos. Okay, that is some good birria. Okay. Go there. Everything that you just described right now, that's what you're going to experience because that is good. But I, I have to throw down to your hometown. Well, it may might not be your hometown because it's Fruitvale, but I went there once. Those were the best tacos. I, I still dream of that place. It's called El Gruyense. It's in Fruitvale right off of the, the train stop. It's this little hole in the wall, and they had these delicious tacos, any kind, carnitas, carne asada, whatever you want. And most importantly, they serve squirt there. So any place that serves squirt, <laughs> they, they're like you, right right there. They're, they're real. So there you have it, folks. Teddy's Red Tacos. you got to check it out. It's right around the stadium. Okay, I, I will do, and I'm from 35th Avenue uh, in Oakland, California, and that's the Fruitvale District. So I know oh, okay. exactly the place you're talking about. The line is out the door. You can feel <laughs> heat from the cooking. You can oh. feel heat coming all the way out the door. So I know it was, the line was too damn long, so I never had them tacos up there. But, uh, you know. You got to go back. Okay, okay, I will do. When I go see the Dodgers and the Giants, I go specifically to Fruitvale to eat and then come back. <laughs> Go ahead, Alonzo. Sorry, I had myself on mute there. Uh, Dontre Willis, uh, Los Angeles Dodgers broadcaster, uh, Sportsnet LA broadcaster. By the way, before I uh, I, I do the, the exit thing, uh, there's another spot in the Bay. It's called La Cumbre. It's in the Mission. Fire. 100% fire. They, uh, they, they, they're, it's, it's, on, I, like Juan, I still dream of the tacos and the burritos I've gotten there over the years. It ain't fair how good that is. Um, but, I'm glad that you're on to the, the, the Birria train because that's, that's a dub right there. Yeah, they, you know, the Mission District, everything's fire in the Mission Baby. District. So, yeah, yeah they, they, I know it's San Francisco, and I don't want Dodger fans to fight me on the street, but, like, you know, that, that, <laughs> that area has that been legendary growing up in the Bay Area about just getting good Mexican food and very authentic food as well. Yes, 100%. Uh, where, can, uh, where can the kiddos find you on the, uh, the social medias if they want to come uh, talk trash to you like you were saying earlier? Uh, you know what? I got asked that yesterday at the Dodger Gala, and I have no idea. Like, I don't know. Like, <laughs> like it's D Train something something, and then uh, my my Instagram is young uh, young Grizzle. They say uh, three five, but I, I don't know because I'm not young anymore. And uh, so, but uh, yeah, they, they can just look it up and it'll pop that right up. There, Dontre Willis. Uh, his handle for Twitter is at D Train MLB. The more you know. We learned that today, right? Um, go, go find him. He's, he's a great follow. Uh, connoisseur of two weenies and a fork because he understands. He knows the struggle. And, uh, hey, Webbles con weenies forever, right, right. Dontrell? Webbles right. con weenies, man. Webbles right. con weenies. The pride of, uh, of Oakland oh. and Alameda. Now a connoisseur of birria tacos. That's called... The, the the marathon continues. You know what I'm saying. So it's it's mm -hmm. the, the great come up. Uh, go follow him and uh, listen. We really appreciated your candor and uh, and and we hope to have you back on. All right, thanks for having me, guys. I appreciate it.